Hello to all of our community advisors and ambassadors and, and members who've joined this weekly huddle. Today is Thursday, June 11th, and this is our 12th weekly virtual meeting. So thank you. Some of you have joined us all 12 times, and so hello again. Um, until we meet in person, I'm very glad that we are able to be together virtually. Today we're going to cover the questions that were sent in ahead of time. And as with every meeting, if you want to chat or comment, there is a chat line um, on the webinar. And if you are joining us via telephone, feel free to email me any questions or comments that you have. Um, we will post this recording either later this afternoon or tomorrow on the Quia Delta COVID page under Frequently Asked Questions. And so if you're calling in and not watching, Gary Herbst, our hospital CEO, is joining me today. Gary, how are you doing? Good. Yeah, thanks, Good. Deb. Middle of June? It is. Yeah. And uh, a little hot out there right now. Yeah. but uh, expected to cool down this weekend, so excited yeah. about that. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. I'm ready for the weekend. Thursday's yes. always signaling the weekend's coming. <laughs> weekend's coming. Yes. All right, so let's get into the questions that have been submitted, but we're going to start first with the numbers. We want to know positive cases in the county, in the hospital, and just the numbers that we cover sure. every week. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of blaze through these. I know I... Uh, I think I found myself last week spending uh, a, a significant amount of time on it, and um, but uh, I'll try to cut through uh, quickly so I can certainly spend the time on the other questions, and then um, ideally we have some that come in on the chat too. Right. So, um, so starting at the the state level, um, uh, amazingly that the state of California now is reporting they've conducted 2.5 million uh, COVID tests now uh, since the. Uh, the start of the pandemic uh, statewide. Obviously, Cui Delta is a big part of that uh, that testing. Um, and of the 2.5 million tests that the state has conducted, um, just a little over 136,000 uh, have tested positive. Uh, unfortunately, we've had almost 4,800 deaths um, now at the statewide level. There are currently 3,240 um, California residents that are hospitalized uh, with the COVID virus and about a third of them, um, just shy of 1,100, are in the intensive care units. Uh, with respect to healthcare workers, uh, statewide um, about 11,400 and uh, we've had 67 uh, California healthcare workers that have um, passed um, as a result of the COVID virus. At the county level, uh, again, state level, 136,000 positive. For Tulare County, just slightly more than 2,400. Um, fortunately, we're seeing more and more cases recovered. So the county has reported now of those 2,400 that tested positive, 1,600 have now successfully uh, defeated the virus and have fully recovered. We have had um, 96 deaths. Um, again, since the start of the pandemic. I thought you might find it interesting. I think this question comes up often. Uh, of those 96 deaths countywide, 80 of them uh, pertain to uh, nursing home residents. Mm. So without a doubt, um, the nursing homes in Tulare County were hit the hardest um, uh, among their residents and among their healthcare workers. So uh, very sad um, to, to um, have experienced that. but um, And there are currently 994 uh, Tulare County residents that uh, have tested positive but are under quarantine, generally at home, um, recovering. The thing that comes up often and I think is one of the most important things is what I call the positivity rate, not a term that I made up, but mm -hmm. um, essentially it's uh, of all those people that you test, what percentage test positive for the virus? And uh, you may recall that a number of weeks ago, probably at the height of the outbreak, uh, the county was running probably close to 15% mm -hmm. of all those out there were testing, uh, were testing positive, um, which probably is not that surprising. Uh, it kind of mirrored what we were seeing at Quia Delta. But at that time, we were only testing patients that were showing symptoms. Um, you know, that were ex uh, exhibiting um, and more likely than not to be positive. Uh, more and more now we are testing asymptomatic patients. Um, definitely when we started back up with elective surgeries, we now test 
uh, all of those patients, and virtually all of them have been asymptomatic. Um, and I think you'd be interested to know that mm -hmm. we've, we've now tested probably about 600 um, elective surgical cases. So we, uh, we test them generally within 48 to 72 hours of having their procedure. Uh, again, many of them are outpatient surgeries, but we're doing anywhere from eight to 10 uh, elective inpatient surgeries a day. We're back to doing colonoscopies and bronchoscopies and things in the endoscopy labs, but we're also testing um, those patients before their procedures. And of those 600 that um, we've tested, only two um, tested positive. Um, so- And their surgeries were canceled. Their surgeries okay. were canceled, rescheduled, obviously quarantining at right. home and um, and hope to have them back real soon. But um, mm -hmm. so the positivity rate that the county, um, you know, they're, they're actually out there reporting it, uh, not daily, but pretty close to it. Um, I just looked at the website this morning and the positivity rate now stands at 7.5% um, countywide. Now that's up from about a week ago. Oh. A week ago we were at 5.7%. Um, well below the 8% threshold that was set by the governor to allow us to move into phase 2.5. Now tomorrow, we, Tulare County moves into phase three, okay. uh, which we'll talk about. Um, but we're in phase 2.5 right now. And the only reason we are allowed to go into it is because our positivity rate fell below 8%. So, and um, it's what now? Seven point seven point five percent now. It was five point seven percent last week. I mean, you definitely are seeing, in terms of the absolute number, uh, more and more people testing positive. Just the other day, the county reported one hundred and sixty-one new positive cases just in a single day, which is probably one of our highest single day, um, you know, rates that we've seen um, over this entire uh, almost four month period now. Um, but it's definitely been declining. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but again, the more and more people that we're testing and Cuya Delta is experiencing the same thing. We're just, we're doing so much more testing. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 22 specimen collection sites across Tulare County now. Um, so you're just gonna see the absolute number go up, but what's most important is that positivity rate and right. to keep it below 8%. Uh, I was really hoping that we'd continue to see it decline from that mm -hmm. 57 but we also have been expecting, you know, a couple weeks after Memorial Day, uh, starting to open up under 2.5, that we were mm -hmm. going to start seeing uh, a higher um, outbreak rate. So that's what right. we actually are experiencing. I think they said in our leadership meeting yesterday that our floral site, right. did they say like 180, they're averaging 180 tests a day there now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the county just got all brand new equipment. So the county okay. doesn't do specimen collection, but they do testing. Um, and so these 22 specimen collection sites, you know, the state set one up in Porterville and mm -hmm. in Dinuba. A lot of doctor's offices now are collecting specimens. So, um, so they're sending those to the county and they're now able to process 200 tests a day, uh, significantly greater than the 30 that they were able to process, you know, back in the early days of the pandemic. And so, the county, do you get the results back sooner with the, the, county, the county versus like Quest? Yeah, yeah. Um, Cuya Delta, um, ours is almost real time. If we run it on the Abbott ID Now platform, mm -hmm. we have results back within, you know, 30 minutes. If we run it on the BD Max, um, it's back in a couple hours. Um, the county is generally about a 24 hour um, turnaround. But unfortunately, we're continuing to hear that Quest, which is, I think, the only commercial lab that's actually processing um, specimens, is still running seven to 10 days. So uh, very frustrating. I know yeah. if, if you're a, a patient, a community member, that uh, you, got, you probably got the specimen collected. You were probably asymptomatic, but your physician went ahead and collected the specimen, and then they send it to the commercial lab, and you sit there and you wait. And right. I, I know that's frustrating. Right. Um, so lastly, uh, here at Kui Delta, we have 29 uh, positive COVID patients that are in the hospital right now. Five are in the ICU, six are in the intermediate critical care unit, so that's between ICU and general medical surgical, and then 18 patients on 2 South, which is kind of our dedicated uh, respiratory um, unit. We pretty much are, are 
um, admitting COVID patients only to the ICU, um, the ICCU, which is on 3 West, the west side of the hospital, which is a 30-bed unit, and then 2 South, which is a 29-bed unit. So all of our COVID patients are generally confined to those three areas. Um, and right now, today, we have 26 beds among those three units that are open. Okay. So we do have surge capacity. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see our number of, of COVID patients below 30. Uh, yeah. We did see a spike not too long ago. We were hitting mid-30s to high 30s, mm -hmm. um, but see, have seen that recently drop back down into the 20s, right. albeit just barely um, below mm -hmm. 30. So. Um, I'm often asked, you know, again about ventilators. Um, that is one of the, the metrics that uh, the state looks at. So uh, I've mentioned this in the past. We own 96 uh, adult ventilators. Um, currently, there are 36 that are in use, a couple of them for COVID patients, but most all the others are cardiac surgery and strokes and pneumonia and just typical, typical mm -hmm. things where the patient needs help breathing. Um, so that leaves us um, 60, um, you know, currently unused ventilators. So again, uh, good position in, in the event right. of a resurgence. Right. Um, I mentioned we've now collected 8,700 specimens, almost entirely at the Floral Street um, address. We are working to close Floral Street down and to move it over to our what we call our South Campus. So um, the Urgent Care Center on Court Street just. Uh, just north of Walnut, um, we will be moving the collection, specimen collection site to there, which will give us indoor um, capability. Um, so obviously we're entering the hot season and right. having our staff and patients out, outdoors on floral is starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, we hope to have that up and running in about another week, week and a half. Plus once Main Street gets back, Businesses start yes. opening. Yeah, floral exactly. Will so, very, yeah, we'll yeah. open back up floral. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then lastly, uh, folks always ask, you know, what about Quia Delta employees? So, I, I mm -hmm. mentioned that there have been a little over 11,000 healthcare workers infected statewide. So, we're not immune from that. Um, I think we've done a pretty phenomenal job. I applaud our staff for um, just their, their mm -hmm. vigilance, their diligent use of protective equipment and so forth, but um, throughout this entire infection, we've had now 101 of our healthcare workers that have been infected. 57 have fully recovered and returned to work. We have another 44 um, that are home, quarantined, waiting to anxiously come back to work, and we have one of our patients that uh, is still hospitalized. Uh, and then among physicians, among the medical staff, we've had four providers. Um, and you think about that over four months, um, and our physicians are right there on the front line mm -hmm. in the ICU and the ED and on two south, but only four um, have been infected. Three have fully recovered, returned to work, and one is, is home recovering right now. Okay. So those are those the up-to-date numbers. numbers. Yep. All right, well, yep. thank you, Gary. So a couple of days ago, my social media was blowing up um, when the story from the World Health Organization came out about um, asymptomatic spread being rare. Right. And then they followed that up with a correctional statement saying, well, it, they were, it's unclear. But it directly contradicts what we've been saying for several months and then what the CDC is saying. So can you kind of explain that and what we are taking, what road we're taking yeah. on that? So that's been the one constant throughout this pandemic mm -hmm. is the conflicting information. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, it, it's changing every day. I mean, I don't even know where today where we stand on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, it was totally dismissed, you know, just a week and a half ago. And now people are going, hmm, wait, maybe that was premature. Maybe it is a good thing after all. So um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating for folks. And um, some of it is just to be expected. I mean, this, it's called a novel coronavirus, novel being new, unknown, people don't. So there's there's little that's known about it other than what we're learning in real time. And we're learning new things each and every day. We have some of the most brilliant scientists that are, you know, working to mm -hmm. find a vaccine, to find antivirals. That, um, so the, the information is going to be changing all the time. Uh, our one constant is we have continuously followed 
the recommendations for the Centers of Disease Control. So the CDC, um, who generally tends to be more conservative, there's no doubt about it, um, they're going to err more on the side of caution. And uh, oftentimes they do contradict the World Health Organization, um, WHO, um, which is you know, one of their top experts uh, at the World Health Organization, came out with that statement. The CDC said we do not agree with it, um, that our evidence shows that asymptomatic patients um, can absolutely pass the virus on to other people. The one thing that's been interesting, I think they both kind of agree on it, is that uh, there's now a belief that contracting the virus from surfaces, you know, like grocery bags, tables, chairs, things like that, is more rare. Um, it can, it definitely can happen. And that's why we're told, you know, always wash your hands, you know, after touching mm -hmm. surfaces and so forth. But, um, but there's a belief now that it really is passed person to person, which is, you know, symptomatic to symptomatic, or, yeah, symptomatic mm -hmm. to asymptomatic mm -hmm. or vice versa. So interesting that the World Health Organization person did kind of backtrack pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it, what a firestorm. I, I walked into the house and my wife says, honey, you don't have to wear your mask anymore. <laughs> we're, we're good, you know, and I'm, know. whoa, where'd you hear? Yeah. yeah. So um, I think there were probably a lot of our, our employees, you know, when they heard it, they're, wow, this is incredible, a game right. changer. And, right. Um, but then so quickly to, to come back and retract that and say, well, I was misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, you, you, you're going to get that constantly changing information. We haven't changed our position. We're still doing uniform masking. Uh, in fact, we're, as more and more protect, personal protective equipment becomes available, Again, we're trying to exchange out even more rapidly uh, mm -hmm. with our employees, particularly those that, that are exposed. So. Right, right. Okay, thank you for that. So a few weeks ago, we had a webinar with our faith ambassador leaders. And um, a lot of them were struggling um, with reopening. Do we open? Do we not open? How do we keep our congregation safe? And so now we're moving full force with reopening of Houses of Faith. And so a couple of questions came in regarding the reopening of those churches. So what are your tips that you can relay to our, um, our churchgoers, our ministers who are on this call, um, how, as they prepare to open? Do you yeah. have any tips for them? Well, I don't know if I, I can take credit for the tips. I mm -hmm. mean, certainly my idea is that, that what churches um, need to prepare for and, and the safeguards that they need to provide for their parishioners are very much like what you're seeing in restaurants and, and other businesses that to the extent that they can create that distance um, between uh, their parishioners. I mean, certainly, you know, families that live together, you know, they, they're not going to distance themselves six feet apart. Mm -hmm. um, and do it only in church and then go home and be around each other in close right. proximity. So families probably sitting together, but then uh, creating that six foot or greater space between the next family or individual mm -hmm. that's there. So again, we get back to everybody's pretty much concluded that the virus spreads through micro droplets when somebody sneezes, coughs, sings, uh, talks really loud, gets really animated, you know, uh, you don't see it even coming out of, you know, breathing really hard um, can, uh, you know, launch the, the micro uh, mm -hmm. molecules or droplets. So, um, again, so if you can create that distance, I, I do, I, I am an advocate of the masking because, um, again, the mask is you're wearing it to protect other people. I mean, you know, I'm... I don't think I have the virus. I'm pretty confident that I don't. But if I did, I'm clearly asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. But the last thing I'd want to do is infect somebody else. So I wear okay. a mask. I think, I think church parishioners should be wearing masks, um, create that distance, and the church should be doing a lot of disinfection. You know, um, I think that's going to be the hardest thing because our church is going live on Sunday. The hardest thing for me is going to be not hugging, touching or <laughs> hugging people that I yeah. have not seen in three months in person. Yeah. So that's going to be very strange. It's going to take a lot of discipline and yeah. self restraint, which I, goes against everything. Yeah. You know, yeah, everything. Within well, you. I'm Catholic. 
Yes. So, okay. So um, when I walk in, I bought you know touch my fingers into the holy water and bless myself, and yes. there probably won't be holy water there because you don't want everybody dipping their hand and then you're touching your face and. Um, so and communion church, will change too. Communion at will your change. Church, yes. um, yeah, and you know it's interesting. Um, definitely singing. You know, singing uh, has been determined that it really actively propels the the micro droplet. So, no singing in church is a possibility because even if you got that six feet, they've they've actually um, done studies to show that the micro droplets can actually travel 27 feet if somebody really exerts themselves oh. and propels. So I would imagine if you're singing deep and you're reaching into that diaphragm, <laughs> um, those molecules are gonna travel more than six feet, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they also asked about mediating the risks for the older demographics at church. And so I think that's just gonna be the same yeah. as, you know, exactly. wear masks, don't touch, don't hug. Yeah. Um, don't greet each other, you know, with the holy kiss, as some churches would say. Um, and but, I, I would, I, you know, man, man, I hope most churches continue to offer a video option mm -hmm. as well as the live option. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really hate to suggest this, but I, I think the, the vulnerable population, the, the elderly, people that have compromised immune systems that are at the greatest risk, yeah. Um, I don't know if they should be attending the live versions yet. Right. Um, and so as difficult that, as that is to not be around, you know, your friends mm -hmm. and family and fellow parishioners, the virus is still out there. It's still very active. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously 161 new people tested positive um, the other day in Tulare County. So the heat has not made it go away. Um, so it's still very active out there and we got to act that way and just continue to do everything we can to keep ourselves safe and to keep everybody else safe. Okay, thank you. So last week you discussed the issue um, with nursing homes not accepting new patients, which was causing um, us to back up here and our sins to stay high and to um, limited our ability to take new patients. So has that changed? Yeah, just as I commented earlier, you know, every day is different, every week's mm -hmm. different, and what a difference a week made um, in this case. So last week when I was here, uh, we had 30 healthy nursing home patients that uh, were occupying acute inpatient beds in the medical center. Um, they had recovered from whatever illness or injury that they had, and they were ready to be discharged um, back to their own nursing home or potentially a patient that hadn't been in a nursing home that was living at home but really now needed the the care mm -hmm. that a nursing home can provide so we had 30 of them they were all covid negative they'd all been tested which has been one of the understandable requirements of a nursing home is we're not going to take a resident back until they've tested negative because mm -hmm. we don't obviously want to reinfect people right. or infect people that never had been infected so last week um, at pretty much the direction of the state, the nursing homes were not um, accepting any new patients and were not taking the residents back, even when they were testing negative for COVID. So that has changed now. Um, there are things that nursing homes now have to do. They have to do constant testing of their residents and their employees, uh, definitely their adherence to infection prevention now and actually having an on-site in pre infection prevention officer um, all the PPE and so forth. So starting this week, um, virtually all the nursing, ho uh, nursing homes except for Linwood Gardens um, are now accepting their residents back if okay. they're COVID negative. And they are all now taking new admissions as well. Linwood Gardens, I believe, has seven active COVID patients that are in their nursing home now. So, um, so they're not, you know, they, they're not yeah. taking their patients back yet and they're not admitting new patients. But um, I think we went from 30 down to probably less than 10 now okay. that are just waiting for placement uh, into a nursing home. But it's been really good to see yeah. um, that, that yeah, come back. Yeah, that is good. That is good. So I'm going to share a comment with you um, around our visitor policy. So every week we talk about whether or not we're going to um, loosen the restrictions on the visitor policy. And I believe we are staying the course at no visitors at this time with 
um, except for the exceptions. Right. And we've talked about those exceptions on this call. Um, so this comment came in today. So one of our community members is hearing that family members of patients are not being updated on the condition of their family members with any consistency. Calls and messages are not returned, especially from hospitalists. This is very difficult for older patients who are having a hard time processing what is happening to them and cannot share details with their families. So I have forwarded this message to our um, clinical leadership team, but I wanted you to know about this message and to be able to address this concern. Yeah, I mean, that, that's disappointing to hear um, because as I've said before, the most gut-wrenching, most difficult thing that we've had to do through this whole thing is mm -hmm. to implement the no visitor policy that we have. Right. Um, you've heard me say that, you know, if ever there was a time that a loved one needs the support of their family by their side, holding their hand when they're scared and anxious, and it would be now. But then right. because of just the risks and everything and, and not wanting to expose those patients or the healthcare workers that take care of them, we had to implement that and, and you know, virtually every hospital that I know across the country has done the same thing. Um, so alternatively, it became really, really important that we had, <clears throat> had a way to communicate still with the family, to let them know how their loved one was doing and to give them daily updates and ideally, you know, coming from the physician themselves, like the hospitalist, mm -hmm. or coming from a nurse, being able to FaceTime with them so a no visitor policy only works when you have a, a very eff effective alternative way right. um, to communicate between the patient, the family, and the, and the healthcare worker. So um, that what you describe is clearly um, not the way it should be happening. And, and I'm glad you reached out to, to our folks mm -hmm. um, to address that. And, and I will do so um, as well. I, I think it is important um, to, to remember that I think we, we ask the patient or the family to designate somebody formally that will be the point of contact. And I think we're trying to limit the contact with that designated person. So I, I don't know if this has anything to do with that, but if other family members who are understandably interested in knowing how grandma or mom or if they're calling in too, but they're not the designated person, perhaps maybe that's why they're not calling them back or, um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know that to be yeah. the case, yeah. but, but definitely um, we, we need to address that. Okay. Now, at the same time, um, the, the command center, I'm, I'm in there every day and uh, I'm, I'm personally leading the charge to you know, change our visitor policy to start kind of loosening it up. I, I happen to, um, to know somebody that had surgery recently at Community Regional Medical Center they had a no visitor policy. But now they're allowing a loved one um, to actually go back into the pre-operating area and be with their loved one until they go into the OR and then they're brought out to um, the waiting room. Um, mm -hmm. Only one person, they have to wear a mask the entire time. They, they, they you know, have to have their temperature, they get screened and everything. Mm -hmm. But that's a recent change for them. Um, and it, they've recently started doing, allowing elective surgeries to be done. So that's, I brought that up. Um, and so, you know, JAG and Ryan and the whole demobilization team mm -hmm. um, are continuously reevaluating that and say, what time can we start to open up a little bit, mm -hmm. so. And as soon as we start to open up, you guys will be the first to Absolutely. know. So we yes. will make sure that we, yes. we get that out to you. So are you starting to have in-person meetings at the hospital? Yeah, we are. Um, again, practicing. Uh, I, I had a, a quality council uh, meeting this morning at 7 a.m., which is a, a committee of the board. Um, Herb Hawkins, uh, mm -hmm. who we got to meet mm -hmm. uh, in our last town hall meeting, he's the chair, and, and then board member Dave Francis uh, is on that committee as well. Uh, a number of us met on the second floor of our support services building, what we call the cop copper room, which is a, a classroom and we set tables up, distanced at least six to eight feet. One person sat at a table. Um, some wore masks, others didn't, you know, but everybody was distanced at least at six feet. We also had people that were on the GoToMeeting, mm -hmm. you know, video screen. Um, so we are doing that. I, I am now, 
Uh, I used to, my, just my one-on-one -on -one meetings with my vice presidents were all done over the phone. Then we started doing go-to meetings. Um, but now I'm actually meeting with them in my office. I have an eight-foot table in my office, and uh, they sit at one end and I sit at the other. Mm -hmm. um, and we remove our masks then and have a conversation. But then when we're done, we put them back on. So we're looking for more and more of those opportunities. And, and folks are going, wow, this, this feels That's wonderful. Good. Good I, I don't think person, people have yeah. been more happy to go to a meeting. I know. <laughs> we always complain about going to meetings, but actually to be at a meeting when you're with other people right. uh, is so refreshing right, right. now. So, so we, um, we're starting to receive requests for speakers to go out into service clubs because the service clubs, I know Rotary, is um, getting ready to commence with their in-person meetings the beginning right. of July. And so um, we will try to follow the guidelines that are laid out by the district, you know, and make sure all of our speakers that go out are in appropriately, their social distance, that we're right. wearing masks. But just for those of you who are on this webinar, just so you know, we are taking requests for speakers and we will try to fill that if they are available. Because I know a lot of our clubs are, are wanting updates from the hospital right. on, you know, yeah, the and pandemic. If I, hadn't, uh, if I didn't have the 7 a.m. quality council meeting this morning, I would have been in Exeter mm -hmm. um, at 6.30 a.m. at the mm -hmm. Exeter Lions Club. They'd invited me to, mm -hmm. to come speak, and I was all prepared to do it. And if mm -hmm. they can do it next week, I'd they're be gonna happy to. Yeah, so, they're going to reschedule um, us. So, so. yeah, I'm, I can speak for myself that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm ready uh, to go back and um, to speak at, uh, at service clubs. And I'm pretty certain, you know, we still, our speakers bureau is still intact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think all those folks are, are ready to get back at it as well, yeah. so. Yeah. So Lifestyles is opening. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Yeah. Their hours, are they gonna have normal operating Nor hours? Normal operating hours, which is uh, Monday through Friday, 4.30 a.m. to 11 o'clock p.m. Um, Saturday and Sunday, I think they're 8 o'clock, or I mean, I wrote it down, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning uh, till 8 o'clock in the evening. So uh, no restrictions or reductions in, in uh, hours. Um, but uh, tomorrow morning, they open up. So the governor designated June 12th is the day that counties, uh, you have to have county approval, which we do have, uh, to move into phase three. Um, tomorrow morning. So phase three allowed gymnasiums uh, to open up. So we're excited about mm -hmm. that. It's going to look uh, very different. Um, we're opening it up to uh, aerobic training, you know, treadmills and Stairmasters and things like that. Uh, weight training, um, all open. But you're going to see a lot of the equipment, the treadmills are going to be spread apart. Um, down on the basketball court, uh, unfortunately, there's no basketball or volleyball because we've moved a lot of the equipment down there uh -huh. uh, to create the space. So uh, I don't know what's down in the basketball court, but uh, if they're treadmills and things like mm -hmm. that, that'll be down there. Um, we, we've kind of laid it out into uh, three phases um, ourselves. So uh, what you're going to experience is number one, we're going to have you know, a greeter out front that is going to do a temperature check. And if you're at 100.4 or greater, which is kind of the COVID threshold, uh, one of the symptoms, then you will not be allowed to come in. Um, but we'll also ask you the traditional questions about exposure to COVID patients and, and things of that nature. Um, the track uh, will be open for walking and running, but um, again, people um, spaced. In this case, they want them spaced 15 feet apart because, again, remember when you're huffing and puffing um, and you get your heart rate up and uh, those, uh, you know, molecules, those micro droplets travel further. So trying to create some, some more difference there. Um, the locker rooms, unfortunately, uh, we will only have the toilets and sinks that will be open, so there's no showering, um, no storing. Um, your stuff in the locker. So unfortunately in this phase one, um, they're closed. Uh, the swimming pool, the lap pool, uh, will be open um, starting tomorrow. Um, we're limiting uh, people to only 30 minutes and only one person per lane. So you got to stay in your lane. In the pool. In the pool. 
Yes. So someone's going to be if you're there with a timer. If you're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know what they put a yeah something on you. Um, the warm water pool uh, will be open for independent exercise, and again, trying to limiting the number of people in it and creating the uh, the social distancing. But um, jacuzzis and the saunas will be closed for now. Uh, water fountains uh, will be shut off, so they'll be unavailable. So you need to bring your own water, uh, and childcare. Uh, will be closed um, tomorrow. So, so that's that's phase one, and then depending on how things go, we'll go into phase two, which will bring back some group exercise, aquatic exercise. We will um, bring back some childcare, but with appointments only. Um, jacuzzis and saunas will open full access to the lockers, including um, now when, showers. What phase do we have to be at to go to phase yeah, two? Yeah, well. The next phase at the state level is phase four, which is uh, kind of return to normal. Okay. Um, so pretty much everything is now, you know, bars, last Thursday somebody asked me about that. Um, starting tomorrow, bars no longer have to serve food. Um, if you just serve drinks, wineries no longer have to serve food. Everybody is fully open. You still have to follow the safeguards, disinfecting, mm -hmm. social distancing, and so forth. Um, movie theaters open back up. Um, so that's all happening yeah. tomorrow, um, again, you know, under with these modifications yeah. in place. So um, I don't know who gets to decide when the lifestyle moves from phase one to phase two. That, that might be a completely uh, independent decision on our mm -hmm. part that we actually don't need permission from the county. I, I think I need to find the answer out to that. But um, personal training will come back, massages, and then phase three is like, completely reopening, no longer doing temperature checks, everything is back to normal. The, the basketball court, we pull the equipment out and we go back to playing basketball and volleyball and kids events and so forth. That's exciting. Yes. That is very exciting. Yes. Okay, so surgeries. We opened those a few weeks ago and right. um, how many are we doing now per week, elective surgeries? Uh, we're doing anywhere from 50 to 55 to 60 almost per day, um, actually. Uh, we pretty much just do surgery Monday through Friday. Um, although we have such a backlog mm -hmm. of surgery, I, I met with uh, Dr. Ian Duncan, orthopedic surgeon, earlier this week. He's got 100 joint replacements that are just waiting to be done. Um, virtually all of them are inpatients. Um, and you, last week I talked about that most of, um, well, I mean, we're essentially back to pre-COVID surgical volumes, mm -hmm. um, but disproportionately the elective ones are more outpatient than inpatient. So we were only allowing eight inpatients per day, again, to, um, to save um, you know, beds, because um, when patients have inpatient surgery, obviously there's a, there's a post-op period of recovery, of healing. And, and so even when we were doing eight, we were only doing surgeries that were maybe one to two day stays. Uh, we've now, uh, on Mondays, we've now gone to 11. On Tuesdays, we've gone to nine, still staying at eight on Wednesday and Thursday, and then going to nine on Friday. Uh, we're now talking about maybe going later into the evening, doing more cases on Friday if they'll be discharged by Sunday mm -hmm. or Monday morning, um, looking to do surgery on Saturday now, so start early in the morning, go later in the evening, surgeries on Saturday, um, as long as, you know, we don't see this resurgence, as right. long as, you know, post-op beds uh, remain available. Mm -hmm. um, staffing is our biggest issue okay. um, right now. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of, the, I, I mentioned early on that, you know, 40-something employees are home right now, quarantined, and, and they're doing fine. Mm -hmm. uh, we check in on them but most of them are RNs and, and certified nurse assistants. They're the clinical staff that are working at the bedside or working in the OR. Um, and we've had you know, a number of clinicians that went out on leave. To, they have an immunocompromised child or parent or, and just couldn't take the risk of being in the hospital and then bringing that home. So mm -hmm. we have other clinicians that are out on leave. So that, that's probably one of our greatest struggles right now is, is just to be at full staffing. So that, that very much will, will determine just how much more surgical volume could come back. Okay, thank you. So the antibody testing, when will that be available to community members? I know it's employees, first responders. Yeah, we did. Um, so we had, initially we had 10,000 uh, antibody tests, much more plentiful than the, 
PCR and the antigen testing to see if you have the virus. So, um, so we had 10,000 um, kits. We wanted to first uh, offer it to our 5,000 employees, our 700 physicians and nurse practitioners and physician assistants, our residents wanted to take care of them first. And um, obviously, well, um, not obviously, um, there are many, many of these blood tests that are out there. Um, and some aren't worth a lick and uh, have not been given FDA approval. Unfortunately, they're being sold and where you just do a little you know, finger prick and um, I would just really caution people. Uh, there are a lot of scams out there, frankly. Uh, we run on a very sophisticated you know, clinical lab analyzer and we take a full vial, a full test tube of blood um, so that we, we have a really good sample. So just processing that many people through our laboratory, you know, of, of drawing the blood and everything, uh, we've had to kind of stage it out. Mm -hmm. So we've now actually um, invited every single employee now um, to, to, you know, take the test. It is voluntary entirely. Mm -hmm. So we've had 1,300 employees that have been tested. And shockingly, at least I thought it was shockingly, we've only had 46 of those 1,300 tested positive for the antibodies. And it's a very sensitive test. As, as long as you perform it at least 14 days before, you know, after you contracted the virus. So not necessarily 14 days from the onset of symptoms, because again, many people will have no symptoms whatsoever. But it's been proven that if you take this antibody test at least 14 days after you contracted the virus, then it has almost a 100% accuracy rate in, able to, in its ability to detect the antibodies in your, in your bloodstream. Um, so to have only had 46 out of the 1,300 is, is pretty interesting. Um, I was thinking that it would probably be a lot higher, but then, as I mentioned earlier, of those 600 elective surgery cases that we've now done since we started doing them again, only two tested positive for the virus. Mm -hmm. So there are, is a tremendous amount of our population that's out there that's never contracted it. So here's a question. So if, so say you might have had COVID like in November and you take the test tomorrow. Right. So will those antibodies still be there? There's a strong belief that- That they, they would, stay there? Yeah. Okay. Now, and generally the presence of antibodies is thought to provide some measure of immunity. Um, but again, this, we don't know about this novel coronavirus, right. if that's the case. So we will learn that um, mm -hmm. over time, but um, I wasn't trying to dodge the question. So uh, yeah. we're, we're making it through now, probably a couple more weeks to get through our employees and providers. And then uh, we're making plans now to say, okay, how, how can we now make this available to the general public? And we're very interested in, in doing this testing and, mm -hmm. and studying it and learning from it. Um, again, we're always cautioning the public, you know, you, you can't believe that you have this immunity right. now, so still be right. safe out there. But, um, but we're probably still a few weeks away before um, we're gonna make it generally available to the public. Okay, I take mine tomorrow. Oh, and right? I've been really healthy <laughs> all year, so I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm not, I'm really not expecting uh, anything. Are you but gonna be disappointed if you don't? I don't, you don't know. I don't know because I don't know that it really. You yeah. know, they really haven't come up with conclusive information one way or the right. other. But um, it's interesting, and yeah. I I really am looking forward to seeing the results once it's all finalized. Yeah. Um, okay, masking. We talked a little bit about it um, with the World Health Organization and the CDC. But is there coordination between the hospital and private physicians' offices regarding masking? So several community members, some of our employees have reached out to us and said, you know, Kuwait Delta says that at all of their facilities they require masking. Right. Um, but that is not so in some of the private physician offices. So do you know if we are working with all of those offices? I mean, I know we have our our physician team here that works with them, but do you know if there's a coordinated effort? Yeah, um, I, I wouldn't say it's like it's formal. You know, certainly with respect, uh, as you just said, with respect to our own um, outpatient clinics, uh, which very, very much are 
like physician offices, so our, our four rural health clinics, our family medicine clinic, um, our cardiology clinic, our chronic disease management clinic, they're all staffed by physicians and pretty much they're all staffed by community physicians that mm -hmm. just contract with Quia Delta to provide physician services to Quia Delta clinic patients. So technically they're, they're part of the you know, medical community. Many of them have their own private practices mm -hmm. besides working in, in our clinics. It's mandatory in our clinics and because we own them, we can mandate it and, and that's what we do. But with respect to you know the, just the private physicians out there, um, I'm a patient of Visalia Family Practice over on Hall Street. Um, I've had a couple appointments over the course of the pandemic and they're all wearing masks. All the providers, the staff, they require me to wear a mask mm -hmm. when I come in. Um, but I, I do hear there are other um, private physicians out in the community that are not wearing masks and they have, they have their reasons mm -hmm. why. Um, and, and I can't make them wear masks. Um, so, so that's where there's no formal way, but we definitely, we share all of our information with the entire medical staff. So there, there are private physicians out there. They're on the medical staff at Quia Delta, but they probably never stepped foot in Quia mm -hmm. Delta, but they want to be part of the active medical staff and work you know, still be part of the profession and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so we give them all the information. So they're getting the daily updates and everything. They're getting, you know, everything that we're recommending, what we're doing. Um, if, I, if I hear from a community member and I know that physician, I, I will reach out to them and say, hey, you know, just got this feedback and uh, really encouraging you to wear a mask. And, um, but that's all I can really do is encourage. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have a chat. Um, our physician liaison is, sorry, got to put on my glasses, wow, um, is also delivering information to physician offices in an effort to provide PPE resources and recommendations. It's not required, but highly recommended. Thank you, Brittany, yeah. for jumping in there with that. Um, yeah, that's, so that's very D good to D know. Siebert, uh, who mm -hmm. is our physician liaison, um, that is her job. She's out in the community meeting with physicians all the time, um, touching base with them, what's going well for you, what's not going so well, mm -hmm. um, certainly making them aware of all Quia Delta services, but, but they've also been actively involved in, um, yeah, in personal protective equipment and where we can furnish it to them. But yeah, that'd be a, a great way for us to, uh, to further encourage uh, right. private physicians to, right. to mask. Okay, thank you. So I, I want to throw another plug in here. Several of you have reached out about being a contact tracer, a tracer and a tracker, and um, that is that is through the county. That is not right. through Cahuilla Delta at all. And if you are interested, um, the number is 636-4900, and that's through the county, not through Cahuilla Delta. And I was reading something about the reopening, and we have to have so many um, tracers and trackers in our county right. to get to move to the next level. So that's just if you're interested. But I don't see any other chats or any other messages. So time. we are good on time. Okay. So Gary, you if you want to... Do you want to open the lines up? Or, or does does anybody, much, yeah. We can open okay. the lines. Right. Bob Croft has a question. All right, Bob. Oh, I guess I jump in again. Um, <laughs> I didn't know if, sure if you addressed this issue. What um, what are the concerns when we hear about South Korea's um, rate increasing now? There was just an article that came out, South Korea started to see an increase in number of cases. Yeah, um, and we're seeing that, I mean, obviously Brazil is having a, a pretty serious um, outbreak. I think last week I mentioned that uh, Mexicali, just across the, the border in Baja, California, experienced 180 deaths in a single day many of them uh, U.S. citizens that have now come across the border and have filled up uh, El Centro Hospital and Pioneers Memorial Hospital are now full and have gone on diversion and are looking to ship their patients uh, up and down the state because uh, they don't have any empty beds. In fact, I think I told you we were contacted to see if we could accept any of the patients. Uh, there's a major breakout in the state of Arizona right now, and many of those hospitals are increasingly overwhelmed. So, um, so it, Bob, as I was saying, that this virus is, is, has not gone away. 
Uh, we are seeing resurgences um, in our own country and in the world. Um, yeah, I do, I do wonder if, you know, South Korea, which early on seemed to respond really well to the pandemic and, and the, uh, the precautions and actions that they took, uh, and perhaps, you know, they just started going back to normal, uh, where the virus didn't go away, it just, you know, was, uh, was laying low, um, and now it's taking advantage of the precautions uh, being, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, let up. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it causes us concern. It's why I, I know people might think that uh, Kuwait Delta is being overly concerned or overly cautious, overly conservative, uh, and I, I don't think we are. Um, I think we're, we're trying to really balance making ourselves fully available and accessible to our community, but at the same time, uh, recognizing our unique responsibility to be there for the community in the event that, that we do have a second wave that breaks out. So, yeah, great question. Yeah, it just, it just seems like the, these stories, especially about Arizona and the southern border, um, are not being circulated right now and we're not seeing them in the media versus you know things are quiet no you're you're right um you know the governor um and again, I, I try to stay out of the politics and and be critical because I, I i do think that some of his more uh severe responses definitely you know he's one of the first governors to to implement the, the lockdown, essentially the shelter and home and issued his, his executive order. And you think about the population of California in relation to New York and, and other states that, but New York had 30,000 something deaths and we have less than 5,000 um, deaths in California. And is that, is that because we're less dense? You know, we have more geography than New York um, or is it because you know, we followed uh, better practices. So, but but he it really is talking about you know like uh, opening everything up, and I just can't believe how quickly we've moved into phase three. We were barely in phase two point five for a couple of weeks, and now we're in phase three. And how fast will we move through that? I'm not hearing anything you know about the Imperial Valley and these two hospitals and. I saw one, one quick uh, story on uh, television about the Mexicali uh, breakout, but I, I've really not seen it uh, you know, mentioned by, by the governor or really seen it covered you know, by many media outlets. So, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 um, and, and then also with, with our churches, you know, we've had a, a group of pastors that have been on a conversation um, with each other and um, while everybody says churches are open it seems to be that the churches still are not quite ready they're they're not they don't have the policies procedures and the practices in place at this point hmm. yeah and i still um i still believe that um, churches are limited to the number of parishioners that can be in the building at any one time, that it's limited to the lesser of 25% of their uh, legal capacity or 100 people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the lesser of that. So um, again, you know, restaurants were allowed to open, gyms are allowed to open, but only if you, you know, meet the modification uh, plans that you're supposed to do. So, yeah, to your point, a number of churches um, can't demonstrate that ability yet to, to keep their parishioners safe. Okay, Dr. Wynn has his hand up. Hi, Dr. Wynn. Oh, you can hear me. Yes. yes. Uh, a quick question. Uh, data, and I found, find that I have been totally swamped with data. I have the good intention of keeping up and writing things down on neat little tables, <laughs> only of course what was very important to me. But my question is, have you folks considered making, you presented so much information, but it gets lost from week to week. And uh, is there any plan to uh, make the local data somewhat available, the, the highlights at any rate, 
I could ask the same question of the county that would be helpful to the citizenry. Just throw that in there. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wynn. Um, yeah, um, Deb shared that, uh, um, that question from you, and I, I really appreciate that uh, you characterize uh, my information as interesting and helpful and meaningful, and so thank you for that. Um, we, we have not been, um, you know, uh, documenting this all along, and in retrospect, after you asked that question, I kind of wish we had. Um, there's no doubt about it. Obviously, the, the data has changed tremendously um, over these 12 weeks that uh, we've been holding these weekly uh, town hall um, sessions. Um, it'd be fascinating to go back to the very beginning and see how things evolved and transpired. We do have all of them recorded, so all I was of just going to say that sounds like a great project know, it sound, it to like go a, back and do a timeline yeah. or a. It does sound like a great project, and and uh, perhaps we could even work with you, Dr. Wynn, to find out which elements of the information you found to be most interesting and would like to to be able to see that you know that timeline. Um, because we, we certainly could could do that, um, and and uh, yeah, it, it'd be a fascinating project, um, and it, it could you know that that's the thing that we're kind of thinking of, you know the the flu season generally starts around October, and I was talking to Dr. Singh, our medical director of our emergency department, uh, just earlier this morning. We're already doing the planning around what this winter might look like. And, and if COVID comes back or never leaves, um, at the time the flu also appears, you know, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to deal with it? And uh, so by looking back over these almost four months of the pandemic and watching how it evolved and all the things that we did and everything, you know, would that benefit us in, in preparing and planning uh, for this coming winter? So while it would be an interesting pod project. It might also provide some some good uh, value for us in, in uh, just preparing for this coming winter. But thank you for your question or suggestion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've always said I, I'm very good at thinking of uh, things for other people to do. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> There are, you know, there are some uh, young, enthusiastic people who are trying to get credits stored up, for example, uh, being selected to become residents. I know that, uh, I know two of these people who are just champing at the bit to do some useful project, and this is sort of under Chris Patty and mm -hmm. uh, Kent Mitchler, I believe, at least, and, and your quality officer. So. There, there would be a human being power available that could be harnessed with a little guidance from people who would, uh, regarding what would be looked at and, uh, and which several people could have input into conceivably. But I think it would be handy. One of the biggest problems about history is that it goes away before you look at it. And most history, probably 99% of it is totally lost. Uh, especially at the local level. Well, I think that's a, it's a great suggestion uh, for engaging the residents. Um, we have, a, you know, 120 residents across six different programs, and they're, they're all required to do projects as part of their residency uh, training. So, um, yeah, they, they have to select a, a, a project, um, and often, you know, something that will be published. And um, so th that would be an excellent um, resource for us, as well as a, a lot of college students. Uh, we get approached often by students at Fresno State or COS um, that, uh, you know, want to do a project, a uh, research project uh, with us as part of their um, education as well. So, so, yeah, great suggestion. Okay, well, our time is up, Gary, so we want to thank all of you for attending, and we will have this posted either later this afternoon or tomorrow morning, um, but thank you. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend, and everybody stay safe and wear those masks. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.